Hello, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a fabulous guest. Let me explain before I introduce her that I have gotten the idea recently, now that Zoom has come into all of our lives, and how easy it is to do internet chats like this, that instead of just shouting out booktubers, uh, I'm going to actually bring them onto my channel and have a little chat. So with that is my first guest in this new idea of mine is Kim from Kay Becker's Books. Kim, welcome. Hi, thank you. How are you doing? Uh, I, I've been very excited to do this. Yes, I'm just like, I uh, can barely contain myself. So <laughs> it's uh, 11 in the morning here. I'm in New Hampshire in the U.S. and it's about 10 p.m. here. So Sean, you're what, 13 hours ahead of me? So it's, when, it's, t it's 10 p.m. on Wednesday night in New Hampshire. It's coffee o'clock here, and uh, yeah, what what are you drinking at this hour? It would have typically been, you know, mar there's a margarita wine that uh -huh. I really like, and that would have been with dinner, but it, I'm winding down at this point. Margarita wine. Margarita wine. That sounds fabulous. It really all you do is add ice, and you're good to go. There's no mixing. There's no putting the salt on the rim. It's great. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well. Uh, we should both have margarita wines for our next yeah. video. How's that? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I found your channel some months ago. How, how long have you been on BookTube? Um, I started at the probably the very end of November last year. Okay. So not long at all. Relatively new. And I yep. don't remember how I found you, but I added you to my subscription list. And to be honest, I just had been going through a phase where I really wasn't watching much book too, but then you talked about me in one of your videos and I thought maybe you linked to me. Somehow I found your comments and I was really, really touched and now you're my best friend. Oh, woohoo! <laughs> so for, for people that don't know you or your channel, please tell them about yourself. Okay. Like I said, I started on BookTube end of November. So what is that? It's been like almost, we're getting on to six months at this point, I think. I live in New Hampshire. I work full time. I have a husband and a, two daughters. One's older and married and out of the house. And wow. I have a, a seventh grader. <laughs> Boy, yeah, so that's, that's my life in a nutshell. Half empty um, nest. No empty nest. I'll never be able to retire. I'll have a job till I die. I, just to support this kid. <laughs> Ironically, I, I actually discovered BookTube last summer, and I did that because of the YA BookTubers. Uh -huh. And my daughter, my 12-year-old, my all of a sudden told me, hey, mom, do you know there's people on YouTube that talk about books? And I'm like, what? <laughs> no way. And I started watching a, a couple of the YA BookTubers, some of the bigger ones, and I was fascinated. I think that's all I did for the next four or five days was watch YouTube videos and I think I watched, honestly, I think I watched for about a year. Um, so it was probably the summer before last summer. And I was terrified because I knew I wanted to try it, but I was just like, no, nah, I can't do this. This is, I can't do it. I filmed like three or four videos and trashed most of them. And then I finally said, screw it, I'm just gonna do it. And so I did. <laughs> Once I did the first one, it just went from there. That's awesome. That's what I tell people that are in that, stage of thinking should i do it yeah be any good at it i, just, I don't know if I'm, I'm scared to try i just yeah. say make about three videos that are yeah. for you only to get the basic worst mistakes out of your system right and you know edit them and play with them and stuff and don't ever publish them and then you'll be ready to, right. to go live and yeah. the other advice that i always give booktuber wannabes is watch the first one or two videos of any of your favorite booktubers we all have right. to start out somewhere. <laughs> right. No, but that's say, but great not advice. mine. Don't watch my first video, but watch any of your other. <laughs> now I'm going to go back and binge watch them. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so good for you. And how would you describe your channel? Well, my channel is I primarily read or gravitate towards literary fiction, but I read pretty much almost anything except for horror. I hate Stephen King. I hate the horror genre, not because I think, you know, nobody should read it, but it's just not for me. And I think that's the only genre I really don't read, but I really love literary fiction and nonfiction. I don't read as much of that. I've started to get into, you were talking about the 
pandemic and isolation and everything. And I was starting to get into romances and some lighter reading just because, I mean, who doesn't want to do something lighter these days just to, to laugh or enjoy it and not have to put too much brain power into it. But, right. but I found some really fun stuff. But typically it's literary fiction. I also really love fantasy. I love mysteries, classics, pretty much all of it. You're a well-rounded reader. I try. <laughs> I try. Do you have a favorite writer? Oh, gosh. This is like asking me if I have a favorite book. It is so hard Your favorite to daughter? Narrow, this, <laughs> narrow this down. I just read um, in March, I read uh, Middle March with Alba from Cereella. We did a buddy read. And I now love George Eliot, but that's because it was only a month or so ago. I love Toni Morrison. I love Jasmine Ward, Louise Erdrich, Margaret Atwood. There's so many others I could name. Okay. You know, awesome. years, yeah, and years ago, one of, I don't know if this is going to sound funny or not, but one of my favorite authors of all time is John Irving. Mm -hmm. And I read The World According to Garp years and years ago, and that was almost like a gateway book for me. That was one of the first books I bought with my own money <laughs> many decades ago. And ever since then, I think I've, I own probably 10 of his books, and I still don't own all of them, so. My favorite, uh, so I, we could talk for an hour about all the writers you just mentioned. <laughs> yeah. um, John Irving, my favorite by him is A Prayer for Own Meaning. I love that book. Yeah, it's one of the best yeah. novels uh, out of America yeah. in the second half of the 20th century, I think I would right. argue. Yeah. And uh, The World According to Garp, I liked a lot. I don't remember it as well. But The Prayer for Owen Meaning, that book has really stuck with me. He's Canadian now. John Irving? Yeah. He yeah. took Cana oh, or maybe dual citizenship. He's yeah. He's lived part-time in Canada for quite many years. And I think just yeah. in the last five years, I think he... Yeah. But, He's uh, from New Hampshire. Oh, that's right. I know, I know where his old house is. I used to, I used to drive by it, do drive-bys all the time. <laughs> That's awesome. And you have a favorite Margaret Atwood. <laughs> oh my gosh. I read The Handmaid's Tale three times. I'm not a big reader. I mean, I first bought that when it came out, you know, 30 some odd years ago. I really like Alias Grace. I just read The Penelope Ad last year. That was really interesting. And I've got a bunch of her other books. I haven't read nearly enough of her yet. So, but I think The Handmaid's Tale is the, the easy answer. And that's, to me... I was real. I was actually really pissy about the Testaments because I thought The Handmaid's Tale was all set on its own, and to me, that was a brilliant book. The Handmaid's Tale is absolutely stunning. I did it on audio, the one that Claire Danes narrated. Oh, that would be good. Left a deep impression on me. I had didn't try right. the Testament, so you didn't like the Testaments. Oh, it's awful. I still don't understand if she felt a need to write that book thirty-five years later. There was no reason to pull it back into the conversation. I thought it was poorly written. She was writing Everyone three said. different perspectives, and I just don't think she got it right. It was a big disappointment. Now, my personal favorite, because Atwood is mostly Miss for me, to be honest, but mm -hmm. my favorite, hands down, is Cat's Eye. It's, I haven't read the, that. That's on my shelf. That is the one that, the only one, well, no, The Handmaid's Tale is emotionally compelling, but Cat's Eye right. is a Sean book. It's about yeah. characters that I actually cared about. And a lot of her stuff is, she writes about, uh, she plays with different genres, which is not really right. my bag. One of her big subjects is, well, how would I put this? Bad friends, bad female friendships. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I yeah, agree yeah. With you. And there's some of that in Cat's Eye, but it was really compelling for me. And I loved it. I need to reread. Yeah, good to know. You touched on this already, but what's it been like for you as a reader during the last six weeks or so of the coronavirus era? We were talking earlier about stir crazy and cabin fever and mm -hmm. everything. I miss so much going out to browse books and use bookstores and libraries. So at first, when everything started happening and we were told, oh, everybody stay home, isolate, whatever. At first, it was like, okay, I could get used to this because I'm an introvert. I love staying home. I'm a homebody. But after a little while, it was tense and scary. And nobody knew what was going to happen next. I read the news. I don't watch it. And so I don't hear it, but I read the words. And I kept reading all the statistics and the numbers of people and how fast it was coming to different countries. And, and you know how that feels. It gets in your head. I just could not 
concentrate and I was bailing on books left and right because I just could not get into them. That's when I started looking for like a romance or a contemporary story and I found a couple of those and they were fun and that it just allowed me to relax and enjoy the story. And then once I got through a couple of those, now I'm back to picking up literary fiction or I'm reading a couple of books for another read along that are a lot more heavy duty. And so now it's a lot easier. It's almost that new normal that we're all getting into and trying to, I think Heidi said this, she got her reading mojo back. Yeah. And that's exactly how it feels. The perfect expression. That resonates with my experience, and that's how we first kind of connected with I talked about myself as a reader at the very yeah. beginning of it, where I just couldn't read or I was barely able yeah. to read anything. I yeah. didn't try the light books route because that just doesn't fit with my interests, yeah. but I just needed to kind of take a break and give myself yeah. permission to read 10 pages or less a day for a few weeks. Right. And it's now yeah. come, come back, but uh, still life can overwhelm me. And it's yeah. usually related to some aspect of the coronavirus stuff. And I still yeah. have days where I can't read much more than 10 pages. But I'm pretty much back to, again, new normal. I'm pretty much back to reading a lot. And yeah. maybe uh, in, I'm compensating by, I think I'm reading about 17 books concurrently right now. And yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed. Head, <laughs> I need to have my head examined. <laughs> I don't know how you're doing that. <laughs> I'm not sure I do do it. <laughs> very well <laughs> i think i'm reading two <laughs> but it sounds like for you you tried books that you wouldn't ordinarily pick up that were maybe lighter than you usually go for and that was almost like yeah. a a coronavirus pandemic palate cleanser i get yeah just, i guess it's a kinda, good way to put it i don't know it, if it, it is almost, but yeah and i mean i i kind of relate it to the things that i like to watch i love i love really well-made artistic movies. I love dramas. But every once in a while, you got to fit in a romantic comedy in there. You got to fit in a comedy of some sort just to clear the brain. And then you can go back to the normal genre of things. And that's how it felt. You know, I read a couple of books that I thought were really charming and nice and happily ever after. Or on the other, the flip side, if I pick up a fantasy novel, it's going to pull me right out of reality for a little while if it's any good. I enjoy doing that too. That's great. I am not much of a reader of comic fiction, but I will recommend, I have one favorite from that kind of genre and it's old. It's from 1930 or 1935. Map and Lucia by E.F. Benson. I saw you review that and I was like, I got to get my hands on that book. Everybody has a different sense of humor and my sense of humor is really strange, but I loved it. I've read it twice and it, I yep. loved it more the second time. It was such an intelligent, witty humor. There's a obviously gay character and there's lots of female rivalry that is explored in a way that I thought was, hmm, I don't know, was it politically incorrect? It was delightful <laughs> and intelligent and, yep. and bitchy and I loved it. That so, sounds perfect. You're <laughs> right up my alley. <laughs> and woven into a story that, well, it was obviously madcap in a, to, in a way and comic. It flowed as a story. The other one that everybody loves is Jeeves. They're, I think they're short stories and they're so popular. Another British humorist yeah. P.G. Woodhouse. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's written yep. several, and I think they're all short stories. Yeah. He has a bigger fan base than E.F. Benson. But I just right. find that it's the same story told over and over again. Yeah. Uh, and I'm probably going to get lots of angry comments now. <laughs> so I just dissed P.G. Woodhouse. <laughs> but... <laughs> and so now, are you kind of back to, like you said, new normal? Are you reading as much as you did before? I'm reading as much as far as how much I'm reading every day. I'm right now I'm reading two books and I'm usually comfortable with two anywhere from two to four books going at one time. And typically when I do that, one tends to float to the top as the one I want to read the most. Right. And I'll get that one done a lot quicker than the others, but if I'm reading four books at a time, I start to get a little uncomfortable. <laughs> So even though I'm reading two books right now, I'm at my speed level, I guess, or my page count every day, and I'm really enjoying it again. So that's not, been a, a really nice change. It's not uh, your happy place, it's your happy pace. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And how about as a booktuber? Has anything changed in terms of how you consume booktube as a viewer or how you, what you feature on your channel or anything? Has you noticed a change there? Oh, wow. You know what? I think about this because it was really tempting in the beginning 
to read books and show books that I knew a bunch of other people already liked and just to kind of get my toes in the water to start. And then I realized, you know what, it's, it's been said, it's been done. I don't need to put my speech in there. So why don't I actually stop and think about what I really love and anything that's obscure or backlist or whatever it is. And if I love fantasy, if I want to talk about a book about dragons, or if there's some well-loved literary fiction that I absolutely freaking hated, I'm going to talk about that. (laughs) And I'm noticing now I'm kind of getting a lot more genuine with what I'm doing on my own channel. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying not to go along with the crowd. Even when I try to read a book that almost every other booktuber loves and I can't stand it, I'll still put it up there. I'm going to put myself out there. And I've had a couple of them. Duck Snoop Report was one of them. I... (laughs) I tried. I swear to God, I tried. I hated that reading experience, and I gave up. I couldn't stand it. Do you know about me and Duck's new report? I don't. I think I saw the book in your background, and I'm like, did he read that yet or not? So how far did you get? Not very, like 40 pages. Okay. I couldn't stand it. I have to uh, just share my review with you on Goodreads. (laughs) (laughs) I got to about page 100. Yeah, hey, better than me. But I should have stopped. I was enjoying it up to about page 40. So you remember the prose style, right? Yes. So this is my uh, very short Goodreads review. (laughs) The fact that I read 100 pages, (laughs) the fact that that was about 40 pages too much, (laughs) mulch, meh, much ado about nothing. The fact that I see why this appeals to many a reader, but not me, thanks, I'm good. Good, bad, and different. Goodness me, what a load of verbiage. The fact that who was character X, who was oh. character Y, couldn't keep track too much, overwhelmed by minutiae, my yeah. new shay, that's easy <laughs> for you to say. The fact that by around page 60, the fact that, and all that wordplay started to grate. No thanks, I'm good, not great, no more grating. I love it. (laughs) So it sounds like we had very similar experiences. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but you kept at it longer than me. Are you a booktube judge this year? Booktube prize judge? I was last year. I'm not this year. Okay. I saw that when I was going back and looking at some of your other videos. Um, I am this year again, and I am scared to death. I'm going to get booked (laughs) on some Newberry Port. I'll tell you a dirty little secret is last year, there were many books I had already read, and then there were many more that I acquired for the prize judging. And out of the whole entire year, I worked extremely hard to read every single book. But there were two that I got beyond the halfway point, and I said, nope, I'm not finishing this one. This is number six. And I felt confident enough in my ability to judge their merit. And I let them go. <laughs> and that's allowed, right? That's allowed yeah. in the, the rules yep. that Robert has set up. So uh, yep. what was your top read of the book two prize books that you read last year? I really did like Ladder to the Sky. That was the winner. I know you didn't like this very much, but I loved Where the Crawdads Sang. And I would not have picked that book up on my own, probably. But and I, that's why it surprised me, is I really loved it. I just loved the story. I and saw it. that you did today when I was stalking you on Goodreads. <laughs> And those are two of the books that, uh, the, two of the few books that we have disagreed deeply on was The Ladder to the yep. Sky and Crawdad, both of which I yep. stacked. <laughs> but but there's, the- there's two more from last year that are a little more obscure that they didn't get real far, far, but I have not stopped thinking about them. And one hmm. of them is Bitter Orange by Claire Fuller and The Shepherd's Hut by Tim Linton. And that one, that blew me away in a, for a lot of weird reasons. I think I only gave it a three on Goodreads, but I've since read another Tim Winton, and I just ordered Cloud Street. Just got it in the mail the other day. Just based on reading The Shepherd's Hut, it was such an odd book, and it was really raw and kind of dirty, but I have not stopped thinking about it, and I'm now a Tim Winton fan, so. Okay, so first Claire Fuller, Swimming Lessons. That book started out really strong for me, like really strong, and then I didn't, I can't remember the details, but there was something about the ending that didn't work for me so but i think i gave it four stars 
but I haven't read Bitter Orange, so I will get to that. But let's chat about Winton. Okay. Because I saw you just read Breath. I saw your review and your wrap up, and I really yeah. enjoyed it too. And that was my first Tim Winton book. Okay. And that now I am about halfway through Cloud Street. Yep. I'm doing a buddy read with Juan of Bookish Islander, and I'm loving it. I saw, I've been tracking your progress on Goodreads, and I've been dying to know what you think of it because I yeah. just received it. Yeah, he's just a beautiful writer. Yeah. A lot of people have problems with his, the way he portrays women. Did you pick any of that up in what you've read? I was aware of that after The Shepherd's Hut because I don't know if you know anything about that book, but no. it can be fairly offensive. And there were several booktubers that really hated that book for that reason. But I, I don't scare easy and I don't offend easy. And I really wanted to see where that story went. And I was really loving his writing. But that was a difficult book to read. With Breath, it was a basically a story of two young boys. There yes. weren't a lot of female characters in the book. There was, you know, one major female character. And I read an article, I think it was in The Guardian, about Tim Winton and his writing. And a lot of the interview had to do with whether he's a misogynist and how he portrays women and how he writes about them. And I really enjoyed listening to his input on those questions because mm -hmm. I actually think he redeemed himself from any prejudices I might have had. And so far, I've kind of been paying attention when I read his stuff, and I'm okay with how he's crafting a story and what the women are saying and how he's portraying different characters. I haven't really been turned off by that. I don't know that article, but I'm going to find it if I can't find it. Yeah. I'll ask you to help me find it, and I'll, yeah, I'll look link the in the link. show notes. Cloud Street, you haven't read it yet. So there's three predominant female characters. Two are wives, one is a daughter. And their characters run the gamut. So mm -hmm. one you could say is kind of on the whore end of the whore Madonna spectrum. Yep. And the other one is closer to Madonna. But the daughter is, she's a whole other piece of work. So yeah. I'm fussed about anything so far. It didn't come up as an issue for me when I read breath. I think right. to, to critique a writer about that kind of a thing, you need to read quite a few works by that writer. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I mean, The uh, Shepherd's Hut, it was a specific type of character. And that character absolutely would have spoken about women in the way that it was portrayed in the book. It was a very difficult book to read for that reason. But that was the character. And I do tell myself that as I'm reading whatever book, if I feel myself getting offended by some language or a, a portrayal of a female character, I go back and I remind myself, is it this character or is it this writer's tone in all of their novels? And I think you're right. You have to take their works as a whole in order to judge that. Sure. And I would just tweak what I said by adding that we all bring our own life experiences and yep. uh, wounds and uh, politics to what we read yep. and so it's a very subjective thing right right so i can get really upset from a social political perspective about something and absolutely no one else i know who's read it had that reaction and that's just how it goes right exactly yeah well i'll be so curious to see what you think of cloud street yeah i'm looking forward to it actually i really love his writing it's very Dickensian, and usually when I use that adjective, I'm putting something down because I'm not a big Dickens fan, but in the best sense of that word, Dickensian, it is, it's quite stunning. Let me look at the uh, Goodreads. You can compare. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Compare. I'm going to try that now. <laughs> yeah. If you have like an iPad app or iPhone yep. app, it doesn't have that function. You have to go to the web browser okay. to do it. So our tastes are 76% similar. Not bad. <laughs> According to Goodreads. Not and, bad. And uh, ones that just randomly, the ones we've agreed on is Shoba Rouse, An Unrestored Woman. I love that book. Yeah. We both gave it four stars. Yep. Have you yeah. read her novel that came out after that? Girls Burn Brighter? Yes. I did. And I thought it was a hot mess. Okay. And I've heard that about it. I've heard mixed reviews of it. There was so much potential there, but I thought that book and... Hanya Yanagihara's A Little Life are yep. both called trauma porn. And I did not feel that way about A Little Life, but I absolutely did about Girls Burn Brighter. I was like, no way that this stuff could happen to this one poor woman. It was too much. It went way too far. 
and I just did not enjoy it. But An Unrestored Woman, uh, I loved. I thought that was wonderful. Now, that's very interesting. What you just said twigged a memory, so I went back and checked, and I don't need to read it to you. What, I'm only going to read one of my good reads to you per video. <laughs> But yeah. I used tragedy porn in my review of An Unrestored Woman. I said it verged on, it came right up to the edge of, in, in places, tragedy porn. But no, it, it was really well done. Right. I don't think you're wrong either about that, because there were certain stories that are like, oh my gosh, I, oh, this is awful. And however, when it's an Indian woman writing about the experiences of Indian women, she has a place in writing about that stuff because to me that's more of fictionalized history so uh, that i'm on board with and it you know whether it got too far or not it was a little too painful to read i was in for that i thought she did a great job with that book barbara pym ah! <laughs> quartet in autumn oh my gosh i love that book so much <laughs> Her writing style, her characters. I laughed out loud in so many places. And then my heart was breaking in other places. And it was like back in, it was such emotional turmoil reading that book. And I absolutely loved her writing. So you know I'm a big Barbara Pym fan, to put yeah. it mildly. I struggled with that book, but ultimately it was a five-star read for me. And yeah. maybe one of my reviews on BookTube that I'm thought was the most successful was talking yep. about how I kind of went around how I experienced right. that. One of my happiest days as a booktuber was when my review of her novel A Glass of Blessings was picked up and posted on Facebook by the Barbara Pym Society. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have I arrived. <laughs> and I finally joined the Barbara Pym Society earlier this year. So there's, oh, nice. They have a twice a year uh, journal that comes out. In a, yeah. I haven't got my first one yet. I think that's enough from this because I am now looking behind you and I can read uh, some titles. So you have the Hannah Coulter by Wendell Berry. I do. I just got that the other day. Okay. Mom and I buddy read it. So there's a mom, yep. mom and I made a buddy read video of that last Christmas. Yep. It's really good. I loved it. I heard that from a lot of people. I almost got uh, Nathan Coulter at the same time, but I thought I'd start with this one and see how that goes. Yeah, I think I'd be very curious to hear. Maybe that's all I can, where I can uh, read the titles. Although I did see Lonesome Dove. That was one of my favorite books. I read that a few years ago for my book group and it was my pick, we rotate. So we take turns picking every month and it was my turn. And I brought three Pulitzer Prize winners and that was one of them. And I never would have thought that these women would vote for a Western, and they did, and we all loved it. It blew me away. Absolutely loved that book. I've been hearing mostly glowing reviews, and again, some readers find the portrayal of women problematic. Yep, and I get it. Yep. And again, it's the characters, it was, I'm hoping this is not gonna come off as too on PC. But for those characters, that is understandable. And they would have acted that way and they would have operated that way. And when I think about the portrayal of women in that book, there is also so much strength and badassery that the women are written as. And the next book is Streets of Laredo. And that, I think, elevates women even more after Lonesome Doves. I was fine with that. Is it a series? It's almost a quartet, Lonesome Dove and Streets of Laredo. And then there are two additional books, which are actually almost prequels. And Comanche Moon is one, and I, there's the fourth one I forget the title of, but there's four in the set. Well, I will try Lonesome Dove, one of these years. You've mentioned your book club twice. Tell us about yep. your book club. <laughs> I actually did a tag, a book club tag about this. There are eight of us, and we're called the Critical Chicks. And we've been meeting for 19 years. Wow. Yeah. Since and, you were 12. Uh, oh, exactly. Yeah. You and me wow. both. But this all started because I was working in a company and was sitting next to another woman. And every day at lunch, she and I would both pull out books and we would read. And we just got to chit-chatting and we both realized that we're readers. We love to read. And we started to talk out loud, you know, hey would you be interested in doing a book group? And she's like, yeah, I've always wanted to do that. 
And then she told one friend and I told one friend and it snowballed. I and mean, that was 19 years ago. And we've got eight members now. We, we've had anywhere from four to 14. In that amount of time, people move and they leave and new people come in. We have absolutely no plans of ever stopping. It's just fabulous. And you said you're now doing it, you're having your meetings on Zoom. We are. We actually had one official book group meeting on Zoom, and then we had two just getting together meetings on Zoom just so we could all get together and talk because we missed each other. And we're like, we can't go this long without talking to each other. So we've just been getting together and everybody gets a cocktail and we sit and, and talk over Zoom and have a great time. That sounds fabulous. Yep. Thanks so much, Kim. Thank you.